Let me welcome you back to Grace Point uh, as we open up God's Word this Lord's Day. Uh, we're coming really to the end of the book of Titus, which we've been looking at for the last five or six weeks. Let me pray for us as we open up the Bible this Lord's Day. Our Father, now God, we do pray and ask as we open up the Scriptures this Lord's Day that you might speak not just to our minds, but to our hearts, that you might grow us not just in sound knowledge of the Gospel, but also in godliness. And we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor Elliot reminded us last week, chapter 3 is Paul's final words and instructions to Titus. And Paul's concern is for God's people at Crete to pursue and do good so that others around might benefit, might be enriched, might be blessed, so that others around might know the grace of God. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, uh, have a look with me at chapter 3. Notice how it begins, verse 1 and verse 2. He says, God's people must be ready to do what is good, to be a blessing to the powerful, to the no ones, and to everyone. And then notice with me in verse 8. See Paul's concern? Having reminded them of the gospel, having reminded them of the saving work of Jesus, what is his concern? It's there in verse 8. Those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. That's Paul's concern, that God's people do what is good in the city of Crete. Why? Notice verse 8, because these things are excellent and profitable for everyone. They benefit and they enrich all people. And Paul will eventually close this letter with the very same reminder in verse 14, and we will get to that. Notice what Paul says at the very end of this letter, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Now, why is there this heavy emphasis for the Christian man or woman to do good? Is it because Paul wants to make sure the moral ledger in our lives stays positive? As long as your good works outweighs your failings, your sin, you'll have God's approval. You will have his acceptance. You will have his forgiveness. Is that it? Of course not. Is it because doing good is a way to make up for your failings, your sin, your guilt, your past? Good works is a way to atone for your past. Is that why he's telling them to do good works? Of course not. As Pastor Elliot reminded us last week, as we've seen through our series uh, in this letter to Titus, Christian ethics, Christian living, doing good for the Christian is grounded in God's abundant grace. Good is done not to earn God's forgiveness or acceptance. Good is done because God has forgiven and accepted you. Christian people do good because God has first been good to them in the Lord Jesus Christ. That has been the great encouragement and emphasis through this letter. Chapter 1, verse 1, knowledge of the truth of the gospel leads to godliness. Chapter 1, verse 10 to 16, knowledge of God leads to doing what is good, to a life that's countercultural, to no longer live like the culture and the city around you. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, the trustworthy message of the gospel, sound doctrine, leads to godliness in all our relationships. Chapter 2, verse 11 to 15, knowledge of God's grace that saves us gives hope and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and yes to godliness in the present. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, what we looked at last week, the Savior's work in saving you leads to a life that does good. It leads to a life that enriches and benefits all around you. Christian people do good not to save themselves, not to be saved, Christian people do good because they have been saved. The good life, godliness, flows out of a saved life. That's what Paul's been stressing in this letter. Now, as he ends this letter, he wants Titus to keep stressing this, the need to promote and to preserve sound doctrine and devotion in the church, the need to promote and preserve God's abundant grace and holiness and godliness and good works in the Christian life. That's his concern. And so you see there in verse 3 to verse 8, this is what Titus is to keep stressing. This is what Titus is to keep emphasizing, hammering on, again, hammering home, again and again and again in the lives of the Cretan Christians. You see there verse 8? Stress God's saving grace so that those who have trusted the Savior might devote themselves to doing what is good. And so as we come to verse 9 to verse 15, we have Paul's final instructions. Paul's final instructions. 
Paul tells us two things that threaten this, threatens this, and one thing we must devote ourselves to. Two things to avoid and one thing to embrace. Two things to guard against and one thing to pursue. He says, we are to guard against foolish words and divisive people, and we are to give ourselves to doing what is good. It's there in your outline, uh, under three headings, Paul's final words to Titus uh, for the church at Crete is for them to watch, to watch out for foolish words, to warn the divisive, and to work to do what is good. Three things, to watch, to warn, and to work. Notice the first two things that threaten sound doctrine and devotion in our lives. Two things that threaten the gospel and godliness, doing good in a church community. Here's the first one in verse 9. We are to watch out for foolish words. Verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Has it ever occurred to you that even within a church community, there are going to be people whose perpetual words to you are going to be unprofitable and useless, whose ongoing words have no value or use in promoting or preserving the gospel and godliness in your life? Why? Because their words create strife and dissension and discord and rivalry that's the word for argument. Their words actually disrupts and breaks relationships. Notice the contrast between verse 8, what Titus is to stress, and verse 9, what Titus is to avoid. You see the contrast, verse 8, verse 9? He says, stress these things, the gospel and the need to do good, sound doctrine and godliness and devotion. But avoid these things, foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments and quarrels about the law, because it's unprofitable and useless. Now, we might not know the exact content of the controversy or the genealogy or the argument and the quarrel, right? We don't know what Titus is facing, but we do know its nature. We know the nature of foolish words, firstly, because Paul has mentioned this before in another letter. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, it appears that the Ephesian church is dealing with the same issue. Now, there we read these words, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. We read, Paul writes to Timothy, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, and then here it is, and to devote themselves or, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Foolish words are things people within focus on and devote themselves to arguing about, making it a point of contention and strife, always revisiting and dissenting and speculating about those things. And notice, there are words that are time wasters. They steal and they take us away from God's work. They distract us from advancing God's work. They take us away from promoting the gospel and godliness in the life of the church community. But we also know the nature of foolish words because it's something to do with the law, right? It's got something to do with the law. We've met this before, Titus chapter 1, verse 10. There, Paul speaks of those who oppose the gospel within the church, and he describes them this way, as rebellious people full of meaningless talk, empty talk, whose words are empty, whose words are deceiving, he says. And then he says, especially those of the circumcision group. And so there is a circumcision group who have devoted themselves to making the Christian life about law, who are promoting living by the law over living by God's grace. Uh, they, are, they are quarreling about the law. And so it's got to do with people within whose words are denying God's grace, whose words are not encouraging faith or trust in Jesus, but faith in self faith in some kind of work, who are promoting moralistic living, perhaps, devoid of the gospel, who are always arguing and quarreling to push their belief, to promote their view. Now, what does Paul say to Titus? He says we are to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels because it distracts and it denies sound doctrine and devotion in the Christian life. We are to avoid foolish words that distracts and denies God's grace and good work in the Christian life. Don't entertain such words. Now, don't get me wrong. Paul's not saying we shouldn't call out or confront 
error of false teaching. He's not saying that. You know, uh, it's not like, you know, like when you see a massive pothole on the road and then you drive around it, right? He's not saying ignore it. No. Chapter 1, verse 9. In chapter 1, verse 9, we saw this. Paul made it clear that we are to refute what denies the gospel within the church. Uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 11, we are told that we must silence those who teach lies in the church. Chapter 1, verse 13, we're told to rebuke those who promote such lies in the church. And so the gospel is very, very clear on how one gets saved. And the gospel is very clear on the place of good works in the Christian life, right? Chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 3 to verse 8. Right, in your Bibles right now, have a look at chapter 3, verse 3 to verse 8. Notice there is a sequence in verse 3 to verse 8. Paul has made it clear that we were not good. God in His grace was good to us. And so we are now to devote ourselves to doing what is good. And so the gospel is very clear on the relationship between salvation and good works. And we must not just promote that, we must defend it. Paul certainly did it, and he calls us to do the same. And so Paul is actually not saying here that we shouldn't debate or discuss theological issues. You know, sometimes you hear that mantra, don't spend so much time talking theology. Why? Because the gospel unites, doctrine divides. Christ unites, doctrine divides. And so you hear people say, we should spend less time discussing theology because it'll divide us. Just focus on the gospel, loving Jesus, and we'll all be fine. Just focus on serving the gospel, serving Jesus. Just focus on the gospel, the mission, and we'll be fine. Wrong. What you believe about the gospel is what unites. What you believe about Jesus is what unites us. Sound doctrine matters, and sound doctrine unites. That's why Paul's goal in serving the church as he opened the letter to Titus, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, he serves the church to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. There is a chain. Trusting Jesus, growing in the knowledge of Jesus so that you might grow in godliness. To grow uh, the heart and the head, faith in Jesus, knowledge of his work and works to promote godliness in the Christian life. And so Paul's actually not saying you shouldn't debate or discuss the place of law in the Christian life. He's not saying that. I mean, he did it in the book of Galatians, didn't he? Unpack the place of the Jewish law in the Christian life. Now, Paul's not saying Christian people should avoid arguing about theology. In fact, Paul did. You read Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, where he rebukes the Galatian church and where he corrects Peter's theology. The Galatians for deserting the gospel of God's grace and embracing a different gospel. Peter, for his hypocrisy, for promoting salvation by law-keeping. So what are we to actually avoid? Look carefully at verse 9. We are to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels about the law. It's a range of things. There are a range of things that can distract us from the work of the gospel or words that deny the gospel or arguments that deny the gospel. Now we know that there are some things worth disputing and debating and discussing. Uh, if salvation by grace was threatened, Paul always argued hard. But there are some things Paul says is foolish and not worth arguing about. Why? Because they're a distraction. They take our eyes off the gospel. They distract us from doing good. They divert the ministry and mission of the church. They drain our energy and focus in ministry. They divide us unnecessarily because they make secondary things the main thing. I've said this before in the past, that as a church community, we need to distinguish between things that are closed hand and things that are open hand, okay? So there are some things at Grace Point that are closed hands, non-negotiable. Uh, they are the main things, they are the hills, right? We will die on and die for. But then there are things at Grace Point that are open hand. Uh, things at Grace Point that are negotiable. They are secondary things. They are matters of freedom and wisdom. Uh, they're not absolute and fixed. They are hills we will not fight over because it's foolish. And so at Grace Point, we have closed hand things and open hand things, right? That's how we approach things in the life of our church community. There are some absolute truths and doctrines and beliefs in our church that are closed hand. 
grounded in the Bible that are non-negotiable for us, the doctrines of grace, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, what we believe about the Scriptures, the authority of the Scriptures, God's will alone is our final authority in all matters of life and doctrine, uh, what we believe about church leadership, that's close hand, we're elder-led, what we believe about men and women in leadership, created equal in the image of God, but different in their roles. We have a complementarian view of ministry and practice when it comes to leadership. Uh, we're closed hand in what we believe about marriage as being between a man and a woman according to God's good design. These are some things at grace point that are closed hand. We will die in those hills. But there are also things at grace point that are open hand. There are things that for us are a matter of style, preference, taste, choice, comfort, wisdom. They are not the basis of our unity. They actually express our diversity as a church. Let me give you an example. Worship style for us is an open hand issue. Whether you raise your hand, sit down, kneel, open, close your eyes when you sing and praise God on Sunday, well, that's a secondary issue. The liturgy, the order and content of our service is an open hand issue. Whether you have a set liturgy or not is a secondary issue, it's a wisdom issue. And if you want to make it the main thing, the hill you want to fight for and die on here at church on Sunday, you're being foolish. Let me give you an, another example. Music, right, on Sunday, the songs we sing, whether we do traditional hymns or contemporary Christian songs, well, that's a matter of cultural preference, isn't it? It's a secondary issue. And if you want to make it the main thing, the hill you want to fight for and die on here in our church community, you're being foolish. That's why I've often said at Grace Point, I've often said this to our pastors in the past, don't get too attached to our structures and forms at Grace Point. Hold loosely to our structures and forms because it's an open hand category, right? It's a wisdom issue. Our structures and forms are there to serve the gospel, which means they can change. They are not the gospel, which means they can change and they will change to serve the gospel over time. And if you make structures and forms the hill you die on, if you make it a point of controversy, argument, and quarreling, you're being foolish. And that's why Paul says, verse 9, watch out for foolish words, guard against foolish words, avoid debate and discussion and arguing and quarrels that denies and distracts us from promoting God's grace and devotion in each other's lives. Avoid it, he says. Watch out for foolish words. Now, here's the second thing that threatens sound doctrine and devotion in our lives, that threatens the gospel and godliness in a church community. It comes to us in verses 10 to 11. Titus is to warn the divisive, right? There is a certain type of person within who is actually a threat to the gospel and Christians doing good. They, they are, they are, there is a certain type of people or person within who are a threat to sound doctrine and devotion in our lives. Look with me at verse 10, verse 11. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful, they are self-condemned. And it's likely, in the context of verse 9, it's actually the divisive who are engaged in foolish controversies and genealogies. It's the divisive who are engaged in foolish arguments and are quarreling. And they're doing that in ways that are distracting from the work of the gospel or denying the gospel itself. Now, it is worth pausing, isn't it? Uh, it's worth pausing to better understand the nature of divisive people. The hint is in the word divisive. Because that word is actually used to speak in the New Testament of someone who is sectarian. Someone who belongs to a school of thought or a group that sets itself apart from others. The divisive are those who are tribal, who, who, who work within a church community to create factions within a church. There is a them and a us mentality that they perpetuate. And Titus chapter 1, verse 10, which we saw before, has given us one such group. Because in chapter 1, verse 10, we're not just given an insight uh, into those who are undermining the gospel, speaking words that deny the gospel. We're also given uh, an insight into the nature of divisive people. There in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, Paul has warned Titus that there are many rebellious people 
whose words promote not just the gospel, not the gospel, but whose words are empty and deceiving. And there's one such group, one of which is the circumcision group. That's a hint into the nature of divisive people. They promote disunity in the life of a church community by creating groups, tribes, factions. Groups, tribes, and factions that are drawn to controversy, that are always arguing and quarreling over things that are not matters of importance, not about the main things, but about secondary things. People who are always creating strife and dissent, either in denying the gospel and promoting something else, or distracting us from the work of promoting the gospel and godliness in people's lives. You see, at the heart of division is always the belief that my tribe is better than your tribe. Divisive people are not divisive for the sake of being divisive, right? If you're a worker, think of divisive people in your workplace. Or maybe at school you've experienced uh, divisive people. Notice that when they speak, right, when they speak, it's always to win a hearing, uh, to win a following, to increase their tribe, to grow their sphere of influence. And if you think about it, it's because they think that they are the saviour or that they have the way to salvation. And in a church community, notice who is at the center in the world of the divisive person. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the gospel. It's themselves, uh, which is why it's the ultimate delusion. So look with me at verse 11. It's the reason why Paul says their minds are warped. The idea there is that they are self-deceived in their minds. They are sinful and they're self-condemned. They condemn themselves by what they say and by what they do. You know, in another letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul deals with division and tribalism in the Corinthian church, he says uh, that what marks or what distinguishes the divisive person and the man or woman of God is who they make their boasts, who they are known for who they gather people around, and where they're pointing people in their words and work. One Christian author puts it like this. Divisive persons frequent the debates of the church. They're always there. As a result, the same voices and the same personalities tend to appear over and over again, even though the issues change. Paul's words caution us about the seriousness of being divisive. And the reason why it is serious is because the gospel is at stake. It makes your tribe, your group, the savior, not Jesus, right? And it destroys God's church. I mean, so serious is division that those who perpetuate it, that Paul actually says this, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17 Uh, It's so serious, Paul says, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to verse 17, he says, in light of the spirit of division in the Corinthian church, he warns them, and he says, as a church community, let me read this to you, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, if anyone destroys God's church, God will destroy that person. For God's temple, God's church is sacred, and you together are that temple. God will destroy the divisive person who destroys his church. And I think that's the reason why Paul doesn't just say, avoid the divisive person. He doesn't say, ignore divisive people in the church. He doesn't say, overlook divisive people in the church community. He says, warn them. Warn them, and warn them again. Look at verse 10. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. Warn them about what? Warn them about what they're doing. Warn them about the danger they're in. Warn them about what God will do to them. Warn them about the consequences of what they're doing. They're either denying the gospel or they're distracting from the mission of God, the gospel. They're distracting from the the ministry of the gospel and the life of the church. They're taking people's eyes off the Savior and call them to repentance. It seems harsh, But when the gospel is threatened because people are encouraged to make something else or someone else their savior, we must act. When a church community is being threatened because people are becoming tribal, we must act. Because it denies the gospel and it distracts us from promoting God's grace in the the gospel and devotion in the lives of God's people. Notice that Paul tells Titus 
to one repeatedly, at least twice. But there is a deadline, isn't there? There is a timeout. At some point, notice verse 10, he says, after that, have nothing to do with them. Right? Now that's important, because where there is no repentance, there must be rejection. Repentance leads to restoration for the divisive. But notice, unrepentance leads to rejection for the divisive. He says, have nothing to do with them. Now, Titus leaves things open. Uh, is he saying excommunicate the divisive person? Bar them from the church community. That is possible. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Paul says, he hands over Hymenaeus and Alexander to Satan. They're removed from the church community. It's also possible that the divisive is to be socially ignored, right? Socially ostracized. Now, we know that because Paul, in Romans 16, Romans 16, verse 17 to verse 18, he actually says that. Most people don't read the, the final chapter in the book of Romans. Again, final words, right? Really important words. There, you find Paul's final words to the Roman church. And this is what he says. Romans 16, verse 17 to verse 18, he says, again, he's dealing with division. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and those who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. He says, watch out for divisive people who deny the gospel and who distract you from the gospel and devotion to the gospel in your life. And then he says, keep away from them. Keep away from them. Distance yourself from them. Stay away from them. Don't hang with them. That's verse 17. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but themselves, themselves, their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. One, the divisive, because they're denying the gospel in people's lives by making themselves or their tribe the savior in a church community. One, the divisive person, because they're distracting us from the work of promoting the gospel and the life of godliness and devotion in the lives of God's people. They're distracting us from the work of making Jesus known and growing people in godliness. Paul has given us two things to guard against in his final words. Watch out, he says, for foolish words and warn divisive people. But he ends by coming back full circle because he now comes back full circle by telling us what to work on, what to pursue, and it comes to us in verse 14. And he ends his letter to Titus by saying, Remind God's people to do what is good. To work on doing what is good. Now, in verse 12 to verse 13, notice, he highlights some people that the Cretans should practically support. People that they should help as gospel workers, right? And then notice verse 14, his final words. Titus, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Now we're coming back to what Paul has been emphasizing in chapter 3. Look at verse 1, be ready to do what is good. Look at verse 8, be careful to devote yourselves to doing what is good. And then here verse 14, learn to devote yourselves to what is good. The, the idea of devoting yourself to something is to make it your profession to make it your occupation, to treat it like your work, your job, your daily employment. That's what he's saying. And rightly so, because we are called to do what is good as Christians. You know, the, the great danger for us is that we speak so much of God's grace that we forget that God's grace leads to godliness. That's been the great emphasis in Titus. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness, chapter 1. A sound doctrine leads to changed relationships, chapter 2, verse 1. The saving grace of God leads to godliness, chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. The gospel leads to good works, chapter 3, verse 3 to 8. We must never be ashamed to say, devote yourselves to good works as a Christian man or woman, because the gospel demands it. The gospel demands it not as a way to save yourself, okay? The gospel demands it because it is the fruit of, of the abundant grace of God in your life, overflowing. Chapter 2, verse 14, right? You have been redeemed from all wickedness and purified to be His very own, so you are now eager to do what is good. Chapter 3, verse 8, stress the saving grace of God so that those who have trusted in Him, 
may devote themselves to doing what is good. In fact, Paul in this letter to the uh, in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 9, he doesn't just speak of the saving grace of God. In verse 10, chapter 2, right, verse 10 of Ephesians, he says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Right? The saving grace of God leads to a life of good works. God's new creation in you is followed by new creation living. A good life flows out of a good heart. Has it ever occurred to you that as a Christian, you have a profession, a daily occupation, an employment? There is no such thing as an unemployed Christian because you belong to your Savior and you are in His employment. And so you are to work at doing what is good each day, bearing the fruit of the gospel, enriching and benefiting all around you, overflowing in godliness, wherever God has placed you. And that's why uh, you read in chapter 2, as older and younger, as men and women, as employer and employee, in the way you relate to authority all around you in chapter 3. Notice how he ends verse 4. Doing what is, verse 14, doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. You see there, verse 14? It is the pursuit of the good that God wants us to do each day that is the antidote to meeting needs and living unproductive lives. Let me say that again. It is the pursuit of the good that God wants us to do each day that is the antidote to meeting needs and living unproductive lives. Can you see it? Devote yourself to what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. You know, what's the antidote to self-centered living that marks Cretan culture, right? We know what Cretan culture is like. Chapter 1, verse 10 to verse 12. It's a life marked by rebellion and lies and violence and laziness and overconsumption. What's the antidote? Well, it's the grace of the gospel that makes me love truth, that makes me kind and generous enough to meet the needs of others the way my needs have been met in the gospel. What's the antidote to ungodliness in the Christian life? Well, chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 12, Paul says the gospel teaches us to say no to ungodliness and replaces that with godliness in our lives. You replace old habits by adopting new habits. Isn't that how it works? That's how you break old habits. You reject ungodliness by putting on godliness. You want to know what the unproductive Christian life looks like? Well, it's marked, chapter 2, verse 12, by ungodliness and worldly passions. You want to know what a productive Christian life looks like? It's marked by self-control. No longer swayed by our worldly passions. It's marked by a life that is upright, a commitment to doing what is right, because God is good and God is always right, and a life of godliness, living in a God-honoring way each day. Notice how doing good as a Christian is marked by two things. Meeting the needs of others, the way God has completely met your needs in the gospel, right? Enriching, benefiting those around you, overflowing grace. But doing good is also marked by a second thing, pursuing godliness in your life. Not living like the world around you, not treating and relating to others like the world around you, uh, not you know, uh, being godly uh, in, the, in how you live as a mom and dad, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, an employer, employee, as a worker, as a student. It's basically a life transformed by grace. Doing good for the Christian is marked by two things. It's marked by a life that overflows grace and benefits others, and a life transformed by grace is marked by godliness, the character of God. Paul's final words is a reminder to Titus and to us that sound doctrine leads to sound living. Sound doctrine leads to devotion in the Christian life. The gospel leads to a life of godliness. And that's why he says, work on doing what is good. He's bringing it all together. Devote yourselves to doing what is good. Live a life that overflows grace to benefit others. Devote yourself to doing what is good. Work on your godliness in the present. Let the grace of the gospel transform your life each day. Three things Paul tells Titus in his final words to the Cretan church. Watch out for foolish words, warn the divisive, and work to do what is good. Let me encourage you with some truths to treasure from our passage today. These are Paul's instructions to Titus, and he's given it to Titus to protect the gospel and godliness in the life of the Cretan church. 
They are instructions given to Titus to make sure the work of promoting sound doctrine and devotion is not hindered. They are instructions to protect the gospel and godliness in the life of a church community. Instructions are actually a good thing. Don't resent them. They are there to protect you and others. They're there for your benefit and the benefit of others. You know, when you learn to drive a car, some of you I know are learning to drive right now, the driving instructor gives you instructions. You're told to watch out for specific things. Uh, you're warned about the dangers on the road and, and he points them out. And you're told to work on certain things, to keep doing certain things because they are good. They're good habits. Instructions are a good thing. Treasure these instructions. Treasure them because they are there to protect the gospel in your life and the life of others. They are there to protect godliness in your life and the lives of others in our church community. These instructions are actually truth to be treasured. They will protect us from giving ourselves to unprofitable and useless things that will distract us from the ministry of the gospel that will stop us from promoting the gospel and godliness. They will protect us from uh, falling for divisive people who by their words and actions are denying the gospel and distracting us from the gospel and godliness in our lives. These instructions will keep us focused on making the main thing the main thing, devoting ourselves to overflowing God's grace in meeting the needs of others and living out God's grace in a life of godliness. These instructions are good. Watch out for foolish words, warn the divisive, and work to do what is good. Embrace them because they will protect the gospel and godliness in your life and the life of others here at Grace Point. And embracing this instruction also means applying them in our lives. So here are some actions to apply. Okay? When Paul tells Titus to watch out for foolish words, warn the divisive, and work to do what is good, we must look at our own lives first before we look at others around us. Don't be that guy or that girl that's known for controversy. That's a good application, you know. Don't be that girl or that guy who's, who's only known for creating arguments and quarrels in a church community, who's only known for fueling controversy and dividing people. I can tell you this, doesn't matter how great you're serving in ministry, if you're known for creating strife, and it will undermine your serving of the gospel. It will undermine your ministry. You know, if you're a parent, right? It doesn't matter how much you do for your children. If you are a parent who is always majoring on the minors at home and creating strife, it undermines their respect for you. Many of you, I know you work in toxic work environments in your workplace, and you know, you know this, it doesn't matter how uh, competent a colleague can be, right? how gifted a colleague can be, if they are known for controversy, if they are people who are always fueling dissatisfaction and division and strife in your workplace, you know everyone suffers. Work suffers, productivity suffers, the whole organization suffers. In a church, the ministry of the gospel suffers and godliness suffers because all our energy is taken up by it. You know, I actually know people in Christian ministry who are not just known for their ministry and the books they write, but also for their divisive nature. Because of what they post online, what they write publicly, what they promote online, always seems to fuel division among Christians. It divides the wider church. It creates trides and factions online. What they post fuels pride and arrogance because it breeds tribalism at a wider church culture. Some of them have said when given feedback, they are only helping the wider church think critically. Now that may be true, but the results are always division. And it has made me pause and it has made me take a step back about how I use social media and how I speak. You want to know how to get a following? You know how I want to get lots, you know how to get lots of views and likes and comments? It's very easy. Be controversial. Be polarizing. That's what the divisive are like in a church community. In a culture like ours, drawn to controversy, we should be different as Christians. In a culture like ours that is incredibly divisive, we should be different as Christians. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9? 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are children of God, for they are sons and daughters of God. The man or woman of God is a peacemaker. They are not men or women of controversy or division. In your workplace, in your home, and especially in the church, be a peacemaker in your words and in your work. In your words and in your actions. Be a peacemaker because that is what marks the children of God. Here's another point of application. Devote yourself to doing what is good daily. And do it in two areas. Right? Strive to do good in two areas. One, intentionally look at how you can pursue a life that overflows grace in your workplace. Right? In your workplace. Look for opportunities to meet the needs of those around you. You know, we're all busy, we all have responsibilities, we have deadlines to meet. But maybe, just maybe, this week, pause. See who needs, who needs your help. Uh, see whose needs you can meet. Remember. God has graciously met your greatest need in the Lord Jesus. Surely, you could give time to meet the needs of others around you. And what people most need isn't always financial. It's your love, your time, your personal care, your concern. Why don't you overflow God's grace to someone in your workplace this week? Take them out to lunch. Find out how they are. And if you are up to it, offer to pray for them. Here's the second area where you can work on doing good. Intentionally look at where you can be growing in personal godliness. Right? I don't know about you, but when I go to work, even as a pastor, I plan my days. There are things I work on. Uh, those of you who are workers will know that you can sit at your desk and be unproductive. Right? The difference between a productive worker and an unproductive one is a plan and knowing what you're going to work on each day. Transforming grace doesn't just happen. You must work on your godliness. You must have a plan. What are you working on? That's why Paul says, learn to devote yourself to doing what is good. You know, let me encourage you this week, go through the book of Titus again and pick out areas of godliness you could be working on each day. Negatively, is it lack of self-control you need to work on? Is it lack of purity? Is it laziness? Is it an unwillingness to submit to authority? Is it a tendency to slander others? Is it addiction? Positively, right? Titus does it too. Is it a love for others that you need to work on? Is it obedience to authority? Is it considering others first? Is it gentleness? Is it being someone who promotes peace? You know, Titus is an incredibly practical book when it comes to the pursuit of godliness in our lives. Because Paul doesn't just tell us the ungodliness we are to reject, but the life of godliness we are to embrace, the change the gospel brings. And so, be a peacemaker in your words and action this week. Look for opportunities to overflow God's grace to someone this week. And look at where you can be growing in personal godliness this week. Lastly, here are some points to ponder. Here are some, here are some things to reflect on, to meditate on. Maybe with someone uh, in the week that you read the Bible with during the week. Maybe after church in your small space, maybe over church lunch or dinner with others today. Here are some points to ponder, to seriously think and reflect on. When are we most tempted to be quarrelsome and divisive in a church community? Good question to ask, isn't it? Because honestly, we are all prone to being quarrelsome. We are all prone to focusing and making secondary things the main things. And we are all prone to tribalism, to getting people on our side and dividing. So when are we most tempted to be quarrelsome and divisive in a church community? How does it deny the gospel and distract us from the ministry of the gospel? Here is a point to ponder to guard your heart. Here's another one that you could be thinking of and reflecting on. What are some ways we can encourage each other to be devoted to doing what is good as followers of Jesus, right? It's a good question to ask. How can we encourage each other to generously meet the needs of others and to work on growing in godliness? Because Paul says, verse 8, stress these things. Keep stressing the gospel to each other so that we may be careful to devote ourselves to doing what is good. This is profitable and productive Christian living. How can we encourage each other to do this? Here is a point to ponder to encourage others. Let me pray for us. Father, we do pray and we ask as we've come to the conclusion and the end of the book of Titus, we do want to ask that you might strengthen us. Help us apply what we've learned. Uh, help us 
to guard the gospel by watching, not just in our lives, but in the lives of others. Help, help us to watch out for foolish words. Help us to warn not just divisive people, but to warn ourselves when we are prone to be divisive and quarrelsome. And help us as well to give ourselves to working to do what is good, to overflow the grace of the gospel and meeting the needs of others so that we might enrich and bless others. And help us as well to live out the transforming grace of the gospel by working on our godliness. We do pray and we ask uh, in the words of Titus that the saving grace of the gospel might empower us, might continue to teach us to say no to ungodliness in our lives and yes to godliness, so that in all things, the Lord Jesus might be seen and known and praised. And we ask this in his name. Amen.